Now that we've seen why we study musculoskeletal geometry, it's time to jump into some of the details. The first detail is to define a moment. This is a mechanical property from uh, basic principles of mechanics, where we talk about the moment of a force about point O. So the force F acts along a line of action from P2 to P1. And now we define a vector R that is from O to any point along the line of action. Given those basic ingredients, we can define a moment, which is a cross product. The moment of M, the moment M of F about O is defined by this cross product here. So just R cross F. This is a vector operation. I'm going to assume that you're familiar with doing cross products. If not, it's easy to look it up. To understand musculoskeletal geometry, we need to know what a moment is, and we need to know what a moment arm is. There's the basic definition of a moment. So, given a moment, how do we define a moment arm? The moment arm, R, of a vector F, about O, in the Z direction, is given here. So R is the moment, R cross F, divided by the magnitude of the vector F. And then we dot that with a unit vector z in the z direction, which you can see just down here. So we first take the cross product to compute a moment. We divide that moment by the magnitude of the force. That gives us a vector moment arm. We then take that vector and we dot it with a unit vector along a meaningful axis. And that gives us a moment arm, which is a scalar. And that's usually how we think of moment arms, as a scalar quantity that is a distance that represents the mechanical advantage of a muscle. So that's how we define moment arm. Where do we get this geometry? We have P1, we have P2, we have O. That's the geometry of the musculoskeletal system. You've been using OpenSim, and you get the musculoskeletal geometry from a musculoskeletal model in OpenSim. But where did that geometry come from? It can come from digitizing a skeleton, finding the anatomical landmarks, and identifying the P1 and P2 for every muscle in the lower limb or neck or upper extremity. Or we can get it from magnetic resonance imaging, for example. But given that geometry, we can make very simple calculations. So here's a planar static analysis. So we're going to assume this arm is just in the sagittal plane. And we want to know how much force a muscle has to generate to balance a 10 Newton weight at the end of the arm. So we can go ahead and do this analysis. So our geometry is given here, where the muscle force is F. There's a point O, which is the center of the joint. This weight, uh, W, is acting at a distance D from the point O, the axis of the elbow. So because it's static, there are no dynamics, there's no acceleration, so the sum of the moments equals zero. The sum of the moments is equal to R times F minus W times D. So that's going to be equal to zero. So the force in the muscle is just this weight times its distance divided by the R, the moment arm. So that's easy enough calculation. We could find the force in the muscle. What are these typical ratios of moment arms of D to R? Usually D is much bigger than R, so that distance of your arm is, say, 10 centimeters, and your moment arm might be only 2 centimeters. So the, the force in the muscle is equal to 10 times, I'm sorry, 5 times the force that you're lifting. So if I have a 50-pound weight here, I've got 250 pounds in this muscle. Sometimes the ratio is even worse than that, mechanical advantage. Uh, muscles can be at a low mechanical uh, advantage, so maybe even 10 to 1. So if I'm putting 50 pounds here, I might have 500 pounds in this muscle. So muscle forces can be very large. Okay, so that's a planar isometric analysis.
What assumptions did we make? Well, we assumed that it's planar, so everything's in two dimensions. We assumed that the joint was a hinge joint, a revolute joint. We assumed that the joint was frictionless, so friction didn't generate any moments about the joints. And we also assumed that we could model this muscle as a, a, just a straight line from one point to another point. So some of those assumptions are reasonable. A planar analysis can be reasonable in many situations. Frictionless joint, that's pretty good too. For a healthy joint, the coefficient of friction is very low. So there's very low friction. In fact, the coefficient of friction is below an ice skate on ice. So our joints move uh, in, over a very slick surface. This assumption that muscles go from just one point to another, it's okay with some muscles, but for other muscles, it's not a good assumption. And we'll see how we handle situations like that. So let's take some specific examples. Brachialis is a muscle. It has a moment arm of about two centimeters. And let's say this D is 25 centimeters. So say brachialis has a moment arm of 2.5 centimeters. The D moment arm is 25 centimeters. So here's that 10 to one ratio I was talking about. So we can calculate the muscle force. If I've got 10 Newtons out at the end of the limb, I've got 100 Newtons here. So I'm just plugging in the numbers. So you see here the ratio of force that I'm carrying of 10 and the force in the muscle is 10 to one. So that's a 2D analysis. What about a 3D analysis? So I'm showing the hip here and two muscles in this situation. Now we've got one uh, moment equation. The sum of the moments is going to be equal to zero. So again, we're assuming this is a static situation. Accelerations are zero. And now we can write one vector equation, this r cross w plus the sum of these r cross f's is equal to zero. So this r cross w is some external load. And this sum of the r cross f's is the various muscles. So now it's a little bit trickier. I've got three muscles. I've got a vector equation. But I can turn that into a set of scalar equations. And that's what I've done here. I've done it in the x direction, in the y direction, and in the z direction. So this r cross w vector dotted with the x is going to be equal to the muscle force contributions along that x direction. So now I can balance the moments in each of these three directions. So for the hip, that might be hip flexion extension, hip adnabduction, and hip internal external rotation. So here it's a simple situation. I have three muscles, three degrees of freedom, three equations. I can solve each of those equations to estimate what the muscle forces are. So again, a 3D static analysis with three degrees of freedom and three muscles is pretty straightforward to solve. And musculoskeletal geometry gives us the tool to do that. We'll see later on in class that we have many muscles and solving those problems is a little bit more challenge, challenging, but we'll get to that in just a little bit. So how do we measure moment arms? So the, the moment arm, remember, is that moment divide, divided by the magnitude of muscle force. So we can measure that, shown here, in just the uh, r distance here. So that's the scalar moment arm. So here's the r vector. If we dot it in the z direction, we'll get just this, this distance here. And people typically think of this as the perpendicular distance between the muscle line of action and the center of the joint. And that's a good way to think about it. If you look at an MR image, a magnetic resonance image of an ankle, for example, you can see that R. So here's the ankle joint center here. And you see that R going out to the image of the Achilles tendon. So if I reach out, I can see the line of action of the Achilles tendon. So here's the ankle joint. Here's the heel. Here's the tibia. Here's the foot. So ankle joint center, that, that's our point O, out to the perpendicular distance to the line of action of the muscle. That's the moment arm. And that's exactly what we're computing here. So here's the perpendicular distance there. 
So when you go through the open sim exercises and you have a model of musculoskeletal geometry, this is exactly what you're computing in that underlying musculoskeletal model. You can also estimate the moment arms of muscles with a technique called the tendon excursion method. Kainan An published a beautiful paper that describes how to use the principle of virtual work to characterize moment arms of muscles. Here's a picture of a fairly gruesome setup where we had a cadaver limb. So here's the arm. Here's the top of the humerus. So here this is we're approximating the center of the shoulder. We've got a C-clamp that's clamping that down. And here, moving down, we've attached to the biceps a length transducer. So we're measuring the length here. So the biceps is coming down. It crosses the elbow. And now at the wrist, I have a pointer, and I can change the angle with flexion extension here. So I can measure the length of the muscle tendon complex at different joint angles. So imagine I'm a cadaver, and I have my biceps detached, and I've, I can change, estimate the change in length here as I go through my range of motion. So as I go through the range of motion, the muscle's going to change length. Now, in a real human that's alive, the muscles can indeed change length. So it's shortening and lengthening, shortening and lengthening. But in a cadaver, that doesn't happen. The, the, the muscle just moves. And we can measure that movement. And we, we simulate the reeling in of the muscle with this device that puts tension on muscle and uh, measures the length. So there's a nice homework problem on the homework website associated with these lectures that will require you to do a mathematical proof that shows that the moment arm, R, is the change in muscle tendon length with a change in joint angle. So here I can measure change in joint angle. I can measure change in muscle tendon length. And I, from that, I can get the, the moment arm. So let's do a specific example. So let's say I've got, I'm looking from the top now. I have this muscle tendon length here. The joint angle, I'm going to use this equation that the moment arm is the change in muscle length with change in joint angle. And I measure. I get these data. So here's my length versus, versus joint angle. And I'm making these experimental measurements. So I want to do a change in length here with change in joint angle here. So I have my d theta. I have my delta L. So I'm going to do approximate this as delta L with delta theta. So let's go through, again, in some detail. Let's say we have these experimental measurements. I have my, my joint angle here, my length here. And now I'm going to calculate my, my delta theta. So going at each distance, I'm changing 30 degrees. So 30 degrees is roughly half a radian. And when we make these calculations, we don't do it in degrees. We do it in radians. So those. Um, 30 degrees, or about half a radian. I've also calculated my change in length here. So I've changed length from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 7. So I can calculate the delta of uh, length of the muscle tendon complex. And I just then divide the two. So I can see my moment arm here is 2 centimeters, 4 centimeters, 6, 4, and 2. So I can plot that with change in joint angles. And that's what I've got here. So I'm plotting the moment arm R versus, change, versus joint angle here. And I'm just plotting that out. So here's my previous length versus joint angle. And now I'm plotting moment arm versus joint angle. So what this tells me is I can measure the moment arm of any muscle by measuring its change of length with joint angle. So we've done that on many different muscles. And here's some real experimental data where I'm showing here the tendon displacement versus change in elbow flexion angle. Wendy Murray uh, did these experiments with Tom Buchanan and myself. And we've done it for a number of muscles here, brachioideralis, biceps, brachialis, and triceps. So we did the experiment that I just showed you. And we also built a model of the muscles in a previous version of OpenSim called SIM. So here's a model of the musculoskeletal geometry of those key muscles.
So it was about 20 years ago, and it was surprising that we didn't know much about these muscles, even though we've lived with them since there have been humans. We didn't know how big the lever arms were, how they changed with the joint angles. So we went ahead and measured them and made a computer model, so now we have those measurements. Now we can just differentiate these curves here, these length curves, remember the dl d theta, and get curves for moment arms. We could compare the computer model with our experimental measurements to gain confidence in the, the computer model. Okay, so those are the basic ideas. Let me give you a concept test here. So ask a question. Muscles with larger moment arms undergo a greater change in length with joint angle. True or false? Draw a picture. Convince yourself. You could pause the video. Check it out. See if you get the right answer. The right answer is true. Muscles with bigger moment arms undergo a much greater excursion. And you can see why that would be true. If I draw a little picture here of a simple musculoskeletal system, and let's take two muscles, one that goes pretty close to the joint here, and one that goes further from the joint here. So we see the moment arm of this muscle is relatively small, whereas the moment arm of this other muscle is bigger. Now let's draw this in a, a different configuration. So now we're up here. So we've gone from extension to flexion. This muscle has changed length only this much. Gone from this whole distance to this shorter distance. But look at this muscle. It was originally this long, and now the attachment's going to be out about here. So it was, uh, now it's this long, it was that long, so it's undergone a much greater change in length. So this is why we are not built with giant moment arms, because if they, we were, we were going, undergoing these great change in lengths. Remember our force length curve, we would run out of the ability to generate force at extremes of motion. So we're built with moment arms that are relatively small, so that the range of lengths over which muscles generate force is also relatively small. So you can see from that how the geometry of the musculoskeletal system has a great influence on muscle function. What we'll go through next is some specific examples. So we'll join you there.